I'm Tommy Salmons. This is Year Zero. So 98, my 98th podcast, I'm recording, almost at 100, look at me, who'd have thunk I had so much to say, huh. hope half of it makes sense, it's funny too, because you go through these episodes and you can kind of, I can't recall like exactly what number or anything like that, but I can, I can recall like the subjects that have been talked about, the guests I've talked to, um, some of the evolution of my thinking in just the last 98 episodes, many of the things I've learned, you know, from from previous guests and uh, further reading, things of that nature. It's, it's really quite interesting to, as a, as a map, to keep uh, to keep track of the progression of thought and the evolution of my ideas and stuff like that. I, I, anybody who is at all interested in podcasting, um, I would suggest doing it. If if nothing else, just for the ability to watch yourself evolve and and burn these ideas into your memory um, in, in a sufficient way, but I digress. Uh, before we get rolling, I didn't do this the last podcast, and I should have, so I'm going to make sure and do it this podcast, because I try to remember to do this every podcast. But head on over to BossBroDiamonds.com and uh, check out all their gear, shirts, apparel for your dabbing lifestyle that's bossbrodiamonds.com and just remember that it goes to a good cause feeding an entrepreneur helping a small business get off the ground that's bossbrodiamonds.com for all your dabbing essentials for your dabbing lifestyle just dab it at bossbrodiamonds.com also, head over to the libertarianinstitute.org, run by Scott Horton and Sheldon Richmond. You got Kyle Anzalone over there. You got Pete Quinones. You can find some of my stuff in the blog section. Um, lots of good writers. And uh, even have gear. It's getting that Libertarian Institute gear going on hoodies, sweatshirts, t shirts. Bumper stickers, all that good jazz. So head over to the libertarianinstitute.org. Help support us libertarians that are trying to penetrate the narrative of the mainstream. Trying to set fire to that 3 by 5 card of allowable opinion. That's the libertarianinstitute.org. Lots of good articles over there. Lots of good podcasts. Lots, lots of cool... Apparel, gear, lots of cool libertarian shit going on over there at the libertarianinstitute.org. Don't forget in May, we got Childerberg coming up in Austin. It's Childerberg in Austin. Um, that's run by uh, Bird and Carr from the FAGCast, the Friends Against Government podcast. Um, I think you might, we might get some appearances by... Uh, Eric Sawyer of the 
Revolution podcast. Uh, I can't remember the. I don't know. I'm going to be on the podcast too. Um, and uh, then uh, uh, I think Pete will show up. Scott's supposed to show up. Scott lives in the area. Um, it's right around the same time as the national convention, the Libertarian Party National Convention. Um, so some of the presidential candidates might show up. Um, there is a rumor that Jacob Hornberger might make an appearance at Childerberg. Um, it's, I think it's going to be about 15, 20 minutes away from where the convention's taking place. So go check out uh, the, their Twitter page, the Ch- at Childerberg, and uh, you can get all the information about Childerberg there. Um, the Revolution Report, that's, that's it. Report. Report's that word I could not remember because I'm such a fucking orator. Such a genius with words. Um, yeah, go check out the Revolution Revolution Report. Every every Tuesday night, they have a, a live AMA with Jacob Hornberger. I think um, next Tuesday, or was this past Tuesday, they were talking about, they're going to talk about um, foreign policy. And uh, I'm recording a podcast with them this Sunday. So check that out, Revolution Report. Uh just go to YouTube and search Revolution Report, and it'll pop right up. <clears throat> then uh, antiwar.com, of course, as usual. Go to antiwar.com for all your foreign policy news. Antiwar.com is publishing articles daily by amazing writers, foreign policy journalists. Scott Horton is the managing editor there. Um, Jason Ditz does a lot of uh, Dietz, Ditz, I don't remember how to pronounce it. I think it's Dietz. Uh, I'm, I'm the Ditz. Uh, he's the, he's um, a, war, a war correspondent or whatever. He's a journalist there and he's got um, his, uh, his section where he's writing constantly, um, especially on the Middle East, which is where the U.S. is constantly embedded in turmoil. Because, you know, our freedoms got over there somehow. Um, so, yeah, antiwar.com. It's a great resource to have if you're interested in foreign policy. So you can educate and discuss the activities of the United States military overseas in an educated manner. Go to antiwar.com. So, all right. So, like, this episode is going to kind of be a part two of last week's episode, or the earlier the episode I released earlier this week. I've been on the road for a week and a half, so I can't tell which week is which and which day is which and where I'm at and what's going on and yada, yada, yada. And uh, Boogie's getting a little cab- cabin fever, and he's laying in my lap right now, driving me absolutely insane. But um, other than that, you know, I want to I want to try to I, wanna, I just wanted to kind of continue the previous discussion, episode 97 discussion. So. I wanted to talk about collectivism, capitalism, socialism, progressivism, communism, fascism. Liberty, obviously, determining value, and uh, the role of the people, and uh, the role that the state has taken in in our lives. So that's kind of what we're going to do. We're going to continue off of the idea of incentives. Um, Maybe I won't say health, wealth, and power of the state so much this episode. I just felt like it was necessary to drill that in last episode. And uh, I might have gotten a little carried away with that. But, you know, as long as my point is taken, I will definitely um, mark it up as a win. So, 
when you when you look at when you're online, especially, I mean, it's just a sewer on social media. Um, so when you're on Facebook and you're on Twitter and you see these insanely obtuse arguments between quote unquote capitalists and socialists, um, and progressives and capitalists. And you begin to realize that from the libertarian angle, which the libertarianism is is wildly misconstrued, it's wildly misunderstood. Sorry, I just hit my microphone. I'm not sure if y'all heard that. Um, it's wildly misconstrued, wildly misunderstood. Okay, so when a libertarian is addressing economics in in the modern scope, in the modern scale, especially from the Austrian school, uh, more so than, you know, Friedmanites or um, the Chicago school. What, what a libertarian is doing is they are not telling you we're not they're not trying to determine how people should act so it's it's not it may come off in a lot of ways and some libertarians do come off in in such a way that it, they it sounds like they're defending corporations and some are some randians freedmanites um those types are would defend corporations and they will call themselves libertarians and i'm not going to say they're not real libertarians because i'm not a real libertarian um so they but but from the austrian perspective it's 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 not an expression of should. It's an expression of is. It's, it's an observation of human action, how humans interact within society, and the obstruction of a third party, such as government, involving itself in the interactions between two voluntary parties, two peaceful parties voluntarily acting with each other. So the defense isn't necessarily of the corporation or the CEO as much as it is a um, rebuke of intervention in a third party aspect that would that would intervene on behalf or um, against one of the parties that being said it's wildly misconstrued as well that the libertarian argument would be that so the corporations can do whatever they want no, the, the, the corporations would not be able to do whatever they want in a free society. It, it, there's a very valid argument to be made that there would be no such thing as corporations. And we can trace this back to feudal times and uh, the discovery of what we now know as the United States of America. When the king decided he wanted to dominate and to, to actively conquest and dominate the new world that had just been discovered. What he did is he assigned governors to create merchant states. 
And uh, then the governor was also the merchant, the, the owner of the what we now know as a corporation. And the governor was assigned a property by the king. And this was his property to rule over as a kingdom and to manage the economy of as his corporation. <clears throat> so in order to find employees, they began to send indentured servitudes over to act in servitude of the governors and to work specifically for the wealth of the governor and the merchant state in which he governed. The governor was charged with paying the king royalties or commissions what come to be known or what was, I guess what was already known as taxes for the permission to govern this merchant state. So the indentured servants would be sent over <coughs> under the under the auspice that they would work in servitude to the governor for the for his corporation for his businesses in order to enrich the governor in order to enrich the the king and the kingdom and in return after a set amount of time i believe it was 7 years these servants would be granted 50 acres of land that were to attach to the merchant state and to rest on the outskirts of the merchant state. These plots were picked by the governor and a deed was signed over to these indentured servants upon the completion of their servitude. So this was the first corporatism. And this is what it became known as capitalism. It did not exist outside of the purview of the state. It was part of the state apparatus. So when the progressives or the socialists demonize the corporations it is to our very best interest to not only co-sign upon the truths in which they speak for there are some truths in their assessment in their diagnosis of the problem of the cancer that is corporatism, that is cronyism, that is what later became known as capitalism. But there's also <coughs> a further truth that it is up to us to expand upon. And the only way that you would be willing, able and willing to expand upon this um, idea that not only are the corporations acting in conjunction with their own benefits and their own with their own incentives in their own self interests for their own wealth at the expense of who whoever or whatever gets in their way but they are also acting in conjunction with the government, with the state, 
because they are part of the apparatus. Even though that apparatus does not specifically state within the Constitution that this is, you know, um, a fourth branch or a fifth branch of government. Nonetheless, it is a branch of government. It's an unelected, basically bureaucratic branch of government that lobbies the government, that ensures that the government passes laws that are favorable to the corporations. And this was observed by Rothbard in the Progressive Era when he talked about the how the railroads created cartels. And they used government to create regula- regulation in order to make it more difficult to create an arbitrary barrier for entry for competitors to enter the market, for new competition to enter the market. And so that these railroad companies would come in come in to contact with each other and they would agree that they were they would charge certain rates um, they would only you know cross over certain certain lines their rail lines would only be so many miles and this that and the other well in order what what they found out was in in their attempt to privately keep competition out of the market and form these cartels that there would always be the temptation for one or more of the railroads to break the deal. And there was no there was no legal parameters stopping them from breaking this deal because technically the deal they were making was against, it it, it acted against the market and um, the natural tendencies of the marketplace and it worked against their employees and their customers by driving up prices, keeping prices um, not too high, not too low, you know, trying to keep everything balanced so that they each got specific um, amounts of, of uh, contracts. So they weren't actually competing with each other. They were working in conjunction with each other, but there was always the temptation to break that contract with the other with the other railroad corporation in order to increase profit for yourself so what ended up happening is they went to government tired of all the rate busters that would eventually undercut or undersell or lower the prices on the um, transportation of, of materials or people. And so they went to the government and they asked for the government to regulate what the uh, railroads were allowed to do. So they would, they would ask that the government basically govern and write into law the existence of this cartel. And this came came to be known as regulatory capture. Because what you were attempting to do when you go to the government and ask the government to regulate your industry is you are attempting to monopolize in some fashion that industry. Now, it may not be a monopoly as far as 
one corporation or one organization. It may be a monopoly in the fact that you have five or six companies that have come to an agreement that we will work together in order to keep out further competition. And in order to keep out further competition, we are going to go to the government. We're going to ask the government to regulate this market in order to make it too expensive for new competition to enter the market. So you have what is known as regulatory capture. Some people call it protectionism, which is a fair word. I mean, it's a fair use of the word protectionism to, to describe this. Oh, Jesus, Boogie, what are you doing? I'm sorry, you guys. This, he is just being absolutely insane right now. Um, and so it's making it a little hard for me to get through what my thoughts on this. Okay, so what regulatory capture ended up doing was it, it further ensnared the merger between... Um, government and and corporations it it was it was in addition to the it it acted in addition to to the already ensnared um participation and cooperation of government and corporations. It invited more influence from the corporate side into the government side. And it invited more influence from the government into the corporate side. And this acted to uh, make it more difficult, not only for competition, but for employees to have a voice or be able to combat the CEOs and the corporate power and the corporate infrastructure and to get what some would call fair wages or living wages or this, that, and the other. Part of this regulatory capture was the creation of the minimum wage and minimum wage laws. What they did is they created a centralized valuation of what labor was and it put companies in a position into which they would have to look for more uh, experienced labor rather than the less experienced labor and training them to their standards, which you would think would be out of the best interest of you know, corporations or companies, if they are being required to pay a specific amount to, to not pay under certain amount and to deal with people that were trained from, you know, by other people to do things in maybe slightly different ways or completely opposite ways, then the uh, corporation finds compatible with the way that they do business then that would, uh, you would think that would cause problems. But what it ended up doing is it limited the labor market and the, and the choices from which the corporations had to choose from employees. They began to cut off specific employees, namely young employees and minorities. And this was a regulatory capture in a lot of ways that was that was racially motivated in which the, uh, will you quit fucking humping my leg? 
Y'all excuse me. Um, this dog is raping me. And uh, so they were um, they were forced to. It, it was racially motivated in such a way because the minorities and the youth of that time were underpaid, so to speak, for various different reasons. And this was just, again, this was a regulatory capture done in such a way that it was instead of motivated by the nature of corporations and government and the relationship that they had with each other since the feudal era, it was based upon racial divisions and, and forced segregation. And so this ultimately is what libertarians are speaking out against. They are, we are pointing out that anytime these corporations are come into the fold, it is not, you know, um, despite government, it is because of government that the government has created the environment for these corporations to come into existence, that the, that the government has regulated these corporations into existence. Not that, and that the regulatory capture, the protectionism is a function of government and a function of every government, not just the United States government and not just a capitalist you know, a state capitalism, but that the communist government and that the fascist governments and that progressive, you know, governments all function in the same, in the same fashion, in the same way. And they do so at the expense of everyone else. So you have a minority of people that are ruling over a majority of people at all times, no matter which type of government you have put in place, right? And so when I see the capitalists and the capitalist apologists on social media disputing the socialists and the communists I find their arguments to be lacking from all sides because none of them bring up the regulatory capture. And I can't say none, but for the most part, for the, the majority of the time, it is, well, capitalism is created, yada, 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 yada. And the socialists will be, yeah, but socialism is about equity and from each according to their ability to each according to their need and yada, 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 yada. And it's more humane and this, that, and the other. And fine, like whatever. If you want to, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I, I, I don't give a fuck with your, what your intentions are. That doesn't mean a fucking thing to me. So fine, if that's the way you want to look at it. Um, but what nobody seems to discuss or really want to get into and maybe it's because everything is binary in the eyes of the state and that high resolution conversation is not you know the way that people like to live their lives and to discuss these things nobody wants to get into the nuance and the gray areas and this that and the other but nobody discusses that in order to live in a quote-unquote society, which is a euphemism for country, that is capitalist, you must have a state enforce capitalism. In order to live in a society 
a euphemism for a country that is socialist or communist or fascist. You must have a state enforced socialism, communism, and fascism. This is the dirty secret of the state. That no matter which system you advocate for, essentially you are advocating for the state to have the power to coerce unwilling people into a system they don't want to cooperate with in. And that if you just talk about capitalism from the aspect of that capitalism is best and all we need to do is, you know, get government out of the capitalist market and everybody will be happy little capitalists, you are completely ignoring the humanity of the people that want to create co-ops or communes. And that if you are a socialist and you say, well, all we need is a socialist government and uh, to own the means of production, you are completely ignoring that some people, some employees are employees because they don't want the fucking headache of running an, a company. They don't. I, I drive a company truck. I don't own my own truck because I didn't want the fucking headache of owning my own truck. I just didn't want it. It didn't appeal to me. And there's nothing you can say to make me want to own my own truck. There's just nothing. There's not a damn thing you can say to me to make me want to go into business with a bunch of people I don't fucking know. Nothing. Not a goddamn thing. It's just not going to happen. I don't trust people. I really don't like most people. So to, to insinuate that, well, all you do, need to do is you need to team up with a bunch of fucking truck drivers, which I don't even communicate with truck drivers. I have like three friends that are truck drivers. I don't talk to truck drivers. So all I need to do is team up with a bunch of truck drivers I don't even know and own the means of production between us and try to organize some kind of cooperative in between a bunch of strangers that have nothing in common. Yeah, this has worked so well with those fucking, you know, um, what do you call them? The, the, uh, the super bands or power bands or whatever the fuck they call those bands that the, record companies decide well this guy is a brilliant musician from this fucking band and this guy's a brilliant musician from this fucking band let's just put them together and see what happens and they end up fucking damn near murdering each other in the middle of a fucking tour and shit so that's just absolutely insane to think that you're just going to put you know just require that people work together, whether they like each other or not, you're completely taking out the human element out of any of this. And see, that's the problem with all of these systems. All of these systems are scientifically looked at as, well, on paper, which we can talk about that, but on paper, it's this perfect little diagram. That if such and such and such and such and such and such are all welders, then such and such and such and such and such and such should own the welding shop that they work for. Not to take into consideration that Joe Bob was chasing Billy Bob around the shop three days ago with a fucking grinder trying to take his fucking nose off. You know, like, you, you just expect these people to cooperate. Sometimes the hierarchical structure works in the benefit, right? It works because it's like, okay, you're a disruption to this, this company. You are creating a distraction. You are limiting the production. So, therefore, you can no longer work here. Sometimes you need that guy making that decision. Sometimes that's necessary. 
And I certainly don't want to fucking be forced to own the means of production with some psychopath who's going to try to run me or my family over because we had a disagreement about how much of this week's fucking profit I can take home due to some unforeseen medical bills or some shit like that. That's not the conversation I'm willing to have. And we're not, we're just talking about the human aspect of it. We're not even going to get into the economic aspect of why this doesn't work on a mass scale, you know, on a centrally planned scale. And that's the problem with all of these systems, the way that people approach them is they're all looking at central planning. They're all looking at, we are going to force you to live in a society run and organized in this such a way, scientifically determined to operate in this way and you have no instinct, no say in the way that you operate or participate within the society because this is the way that it works. This is what we allow. We've seen this time and time and time and time again. You've heard it. I've heard it said that the difference between a cult and um, religion is that a religious savior is dead and a cult savior is still alive. But that's not it at all. That's not it at all. It's very easy to see what the difference is. If you look at it from a libertarian angle, read Anatomy of the State, read Our Enemy of the State, you can very easily see what the dynamics are between a cult and a religion. A cult, like the Davidians in Waco, Jim Jones, um, that group from Wild Wild Country that ends up with the, with the full weight and power of the state coming down upon them, doesn't adhere, doesn't legitimize, doesn't respect the authority of the state. Whereas Christianity, Islam, Scientology, they all recognize the state as a legitimate force given power by God. So the, the communities, the communes, if you will, formed by religious sects that do not adhere or legitimize or recognize the power of the state as a necessary good in this world are absolutely destroyed, murdered, set on fire just because they chose to live outside the purview of the state. Because they added no value to the state. The state was not incentivized. They did not increase the health, wealth, and power of the state. They questioned it. They not only questioned it, they acted in direct opposition to it. And those, like Christianity or Islam or Scientology... In a state, a country that is supposed to allow the freedom to serve or not serve any God that you wish are the only ones allowed to exist because they give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. They uh, legitimize the state. They recognize the state as Gaining its authority from their God, from their Savior. And therefore, the state sees them as no threat. The state sees them as very best or very worst and necessary evil. But um, as institutions or religions that work within the purview in order to further the health, wealth, and power of the state. It's not that difficult. See, so many people, and I fell into this category at one time, dislike, say they dislike nationalism or socialism, 
or communism, progressivism, due to its collectivist ideology. And there is an aspect to these isms to which they put together this collective mantra, this, 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 hey, stop it, Boogie, this collective thought. And they uh, act as if everyone is part of a single consciousness in some weird, you know, eccentric experiment in which if only we can tap into the single consciousness and exploit the knowledge of that consciousness, it will further the welfare of society. And in order to do that, we use social engineering or central planning, which leads to regulatory capture and protectionism cronyism, corruption, greed, all these human traits that tend to appear when power is present. (laughs) But they view libertarians as individualists, you know, atomized. You want to be atomized. You don't want to operate within the confines of society, within the structure of society, to obey the rules. It's not necessarily true. See, because the libertarian perspective is that we're all individuals, in that we all think as individuals, act as individuals in our own self-interest and our self-interest directly correlates with the interest of the collective if we expect to be successful if we expect to have a fulfilling life that the individual acting in self-interest in such a way that harms others is the individual that will suffer the most. He'll be ostracized. He'll be left for dead, murdered. He'll be starving. That he won't be welcomed into a community because he acts in a way that is opposite to the well-being of those around him. Well, if we're worried about sociopaths and psychopaths, look no further than Washington, D.C. And you'll find all of them you need. As many psychopaths and sociopaths as you want to encounter live in the D.C. area. And that they do not allow law or society or rules to get in their way. That they act in their own self-interest despite the consequences all the time. And that The existence of government doesn't stop psychopaths and sociopaths from coming into existence. It just gives them a place to concentrate power and practice their psychopathy outside the purview of law, outside any negative consequences that would occur had they done that in 
a boom town in the 1800s. So what the libertarian recognizes is that, yes, the community, the family, the society is a collective, but it's a collective of individuals acting spontaneously in their own self-interest with rational intent in order to perpetuate a better life for themselves and their family. And in order to create a better life for yourself and your family, you must create value for those people around you. Something of value, a service, a product, something that those around you would wish to encounter and to actually pay for and would desire. And that acting in your own self-interest does not mean going over to your neighbors and murdering them. And stealing all their things. Because as soon as it's found out that you went over to your neighbors and stole all his things, the community is going to turn on you. And they will murder you and steal all of your things. So the true collective is the marketplace. A place in which the collective decides what is and isn't of value for the, mar- for the society at hand. But the forced integration or forced segregation that is required when a state is in power is not a collective. It is a prison in which you are put in the confines, the invisible chains of the state forced to bake a Nazi cake for a Jewish wedding, a.k.a. Gary Johnson, and you have limited choices and, and opportunities. The state is not some humanitarian collective consciousness that acts in the general welfare of society. The state is an authoritarian structure that forces collectivism through the threat of violence. So when the libertarian is being called, you know, like being accused of atomization, you must look no further than the market and what creates a success within the marketplace. What would a success be? How would you measure that success? Is it selfish to invent a product or a service that may help the environment or that may help drug addicts and to earn a living off of the invention of that product? Or have you actually provided value to the collective and are repaid for the value that you have produced? So in a free society, among a free people, the only collective that we should be concerned with is the collective uh, collection of people that act voluntarily within the marketplace. And any other collective that is created through violence, the threat of violence, forced integration, or forced segregation, is not only illegitimate, it should be shunned. The, The idea that you must be 
forced to cooperate and operate among those that you disagree with vehemently, that you despise, is what libertarians are against. And when a libertarian offers an explanation as to what is happening among the corporations, between the corporations and government, and between the corporations, government, and the employees, the libertarian is not necessarily offering the defense of the corporation, but they are observing the decisions made by the employees, by the corporation, and the incentives that are laid out by the government that create these, these false binaries or these, these selective choices, this limit in choice for all of the parties involved or for the two main parties involved, and that the government's actions are acting in favor of the corporation and not in favor of the individual. That the government, whether it be the, the Soviet Union, Venezuela, Nazi Germany, Mussolini's Italy, or the United States of America today, are acting in its own self-interests are acting in the interest of its friends and its beneficiaries, not in the interest of the people. That the market is the best arbiter of what's in the best interest of the people because the market would not allow for a millionaire that has provided no uh, amount of value to the society to exist or to monopolize a marketplace and that there would be no protection against competition rising up. There would be no regulatory capture in a laissez-faire free society. Therefore, giving equal opportunity and ample opportunity to any that wish to enter the marketplace. And then if, that, if there are those that wish to enter into co-ops, then they can enter into co-ops. And if there are those that wish to sell their labor to an employer, they are free to sell their labor to an employer. That there aren't limits to these structures, that there is not one ism that encapsulates the desires and needs and intentions of every individual within society, that every individual within society has the right to choose their own ism based upon what's best for their life and not enforce their ism onto those that do not wish to participate within that ism. And that should be the conversation that we're having with capitalists and socialists and communists and progressives. Don't be forcing, trying to enforce your idea of the best ism. Listen to their concerns, find common ground, and share in freedom in a way that you can all cooperate in a semi-civil way, understanding that the regulatory capture is not created by the people supporting the corporations or the CEOs, if there are those, but it is created by the government that is propping up these corporations and these CEOs at the expense of those that could be competing in that marketplace, whether that would be a co-op or an individual entrepreneur that enters into the marketplace. So I think that was a lot. I hit almost an hour there. So I hope I'm right. 
let me know what y'all think. Hit me up. I'm on Facebook, Tommy D. Salmon's Burger, which is hilarious because I'm a Salmon's Burger or a Salmon Burger. Or you can uh, catch me. Uh, you can email me, Tommy Salmons at gmail.com. Uh, or you can find my post at the Libertarian Institute.org. Anyway, I'll be getting my website up and moving this year. I promise. I know it's been a while since I've had a website up. I shut down the last one because I, uh, well, I don't know. I don't even remember why I shut it down. I kept the domain names, though. So we'll be getting that up and running this year. Appreciate y'all listening. I'm Tommy Salmons. Late.